Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron, the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to review Succession, Season 4, Episode 7, Tailgate Party. Directed by Robert Pulsini and Shari Springer Berman, and written by Will Tracy, another solid episode. We were wondering if this was going to take place at a football game or a sporting event, but no, it's the day before the election, the most consequential and important election of our lifetimes, as is every single election, according to the mainstream media, but I thought it was very entertaining. You know, the amount of drama that they've been able to build between their characters in these small spaces, like episode four, when they're all huddled in Logan's townhouse, right? The episode, the characters never leave that house, but there's so much tension, there's so much drama happening within. And it's similar with this episode, where most of it does take place at Tom and Shiv's house, them hosting this party. Uh, and I thought the main theme of the episode was deception. Showrunner Jesse Armstrong talked about it at the end, the influence of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf about a couple trying to navigate turmoil in their marriage amidst a social gathering. So you have to put on the smiling faces, but behind closed doors, or in this case, see-through doors, tempers fly. And it's not only between Shiv and Tom, but also what Matson is trying to keep under wraps and Kendall, <laughs> since he became co-CEO, all the backdoor dealing and maneuvering that he's been trying to do, so... Part of my plans, I love them, but not in love with them, you know? Mm -hmm. One head, one crown. Deception was the main theme, and once again, the writing was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, deception seems to be like the theme of just like the entire show. Yeah, no, that's a good point. <laughs> a lot of deception, a lot of deceiving. <laughs> I mean, I'm being deceived every episode, I feel like. It's like even with characters, like Shiv, for example, you think she's working with Madsen because she wants to deal and they want to get out clean and then they can go do Pierce. But like this episode, you get the idea like, no, she's vying for potentially be CEO when he takes over. So it's like three varies. We're just being decepted by people being deceived. Right, That's it's fun. It's almost like um, an interactive experience, like we're part of the show, because there's so many plans, there's so much backstabbing that it's impossible to keep up with it. Although one of the reoccurring funniest things about this show is Shiv having all these plans and then watching them blow up in her face. Yeah. That look on her face when she realizes what Matsu was doing, God damn it! I picked the wrong horse. Again. My horse is veered off the track and I'm tied up by the ankle. Yeah, her horse didn't even make it to gate at the derby. No, <laughs> he's still chilling behind the gate. Or dead. <laughs> they took him out back. <laughs> yeah, because usually in shows, like, you'll see a character playing both sides, but when you get to a moment by themselves, like, you kind of see their true intentions, or they reveal their true intentions. Here, they just keep that a secret from the viewer, and the whole time, like, you think one thing, and it's really another thing, so you really don't know until you know. Right, but the, the arrogance of Shiv, because we said it on the last episode, after this deal goes through, what leverage does she have over Matson? None. Dude, whatsoever. why can't anybody just be rich and that's good enough? It never is. This is so, like, pointless. <laughs> just be rich. Yeah, and to that point, it's all the maneuvering that's going on in this room. It feels like the end of the world. Every decision is so important. The consequences could be so dire. But then they realize at the end of the day, no matter who wins the election, they got to cozy up to the winner. So life goes on. You're still going to have your influence. You may not be as influential. So it always just feels like the world is not enough, right? With Shiv, her marriage is on the right track, but she wants more. She's more focused in these meetings on her own position rather than Tom's. Sure. Nate. Yeah. it would be good to see Nate. What do I care? And we see how that weighs on Tom throughout the entire episode, where he starts off as on a high, and he ends the episode on the lowest of lows with that final shot of him in the bed. With Shiv's character, it is just so funny. You know, we've made the comparisons to Cersei, and a lot of it does stem from not having that approval from Logan, because she's looking to get from Matson what she was always denied from Logan, and it's a position of power. And as I said, she has absolutely no leverage. Madsen's having a great time talking with her, flirting back and forth. But as soon as she brings that up, he ditches her and yep. goes to hang out with his abusive buddies, Oscar, who is one of the biggest piece of shits yeah, in the entire show. really mean. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, he's just a nice like, guy. It is funny how Greg sort of flipped it, where Greg realized, oh, if I just bully the woman that they've been abusing for the past how many months, years they'll like me. Yeah, and I even with like scenes like that, it's like you never really know, like are they just fucking with Greg? 
Like when they're talking about, oh, you fired someone? Like it almost comes off like they're like playing at their own little sick joke with him, like pretending like, oh, that, like talking him up when they really just still think he's a joke. But yeah, these people are just not real. And <laughs> I think it's so like watching it as a, a normal person, thinking about the decisions they make and how everything is so life and death. When you like take a step back, it's just like, man, worst case scenario is many people's heights that they would never reach right well it's it's just a totally it's a totally different world when you have the conversation between kendall and rava talking about the abuse that her right. that their daughter suffered and kendall's first response is why is she out on the street because they're living a normal life they're not all the way up on the world's tallest towers negotiating all these world breaking or world ending deals when he says I- i'm doing this for my kids he hasn't thought about his kids in like three seasons and I think that's why it's, it's such a good job of the writers and the showrunners of not not even putting them in the show anymore. Yeah. Because they are quite literally an afterthought. And that scene, Rava, she's always had a love for Kendall. But naturally, because of the way he lives his life and because of her wanting a, no- a more normal life, they've grown apart. But you always felt like there was a lot of pity and a lot of sympathy. But here, it almost felt like a breaking point where he's just so detached from the real world blaming her as a parent, saying that you should have been there. You know, it's ridiculous things to lay on her plate. Okay, I'm breaking my back, and it's all for them. <laughs> I think that scene in particular captures the duality of their worlds, Yeah, well, where they even- are so high up, and they, they can no longer grasp the concept of their feet walking on the ground. Type yeah, of thing. I mean, even reflecting Kendall and Rava to Shiv and Tom, um, you know, Tom's definitely more in that world than she is and tries to play the game and obviously is one of his goals in life or one of the reasons why he was was with Shiv is to gain this status. So he very much wants to be a part of this world where Rava doesn't. But also when you look at it from Kendall's perspective, Shiv's perspective, their kind of disregard or even just not even understanding that world or like for instance when she says she basically tries to flip it on tom in that argument saying oh like you're getting out of this okay like no no he's not you're the one that no matter what happens is probably going to be okay and that's what tom says he says that because she's a strong bitch or something like that but also her name and her status and the billions of dollars she has right right yeah so like it's yeah maybe you didn't get your way in this particular instance but regardless of what happens you're good rava tom they're very well off but not in the position that they would have been yeah and it is interesting with tom and rava the comparisons and the contrast because tom is so afraid of losing his status even though like you said he understands the the real world better than these characters because he comes from it he has everything to lose here job his status his career like his wife and Rava realizes that she's never going to escape this world because even though they've have separated and they have a divorce her children are going to be picked on because of the company that Kendall is now in charge of and she's just never going to escape it so as much as she likes to keep her distance she's still a part of that world and Kendall is no longer somebody that she can depend on. Right, their grandfather just died. Right, and they're, they're nowhere to be found. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if that's their last interaction of the show. Three episodes left, we haven't really seen her in a while. That scene could have so much more added significance if that is the last time they have any interaction, because that's basically ending their story on that note. And it will kind of further, I guess, establish Kendall as a deadbeat father in a lot of ways maybe not financially but what's probably more important the emotional support and being there for his children right yeah the things that he never got from logan things that shiv and roman never got from logan so the way that logan's personality manifests in kendall it's usually the worst ways where you're not there for your children but you're also still kendall when you're trying to be ceo so you have that moment between him and nate where nate says you're not logan i'm not gil that's the best i think line of this the show because it really reinforces that. It's like, and he says that's a good thing. Right. It's like you're always trying to be Logan, but why? Yeah, he's never Logan in the sense of making the right deals or picking the right horse, but he is Logan when it comes to his children. The performance of Jeremy Strong, I mean, he's gotten all the praise and all the compliments over the years, but it's it's a combination of the performance and also the writing. I don't think a character has ever been this fully realized. It's almost like you know where his stance would be on certain things. Like, if you were to say, hey, Kendall, who's the best basketball player of all time? Uh, Jordan's great, but LeBron, tougher ever. So he definitely thinks LeBron is the GOAT, which makes me think that LeBron is not the GOAT. <laughs> 
<laughs> Graduation's his favorite Kanye West album. That's how real he feels. Like when he's going back and forth with Madsen about living in New York City. Like, uh, uh well, we still run shit. Yeah. <laughs> he's, so... he's 27 rings. It's like, yeah, yeah, haven't won a World Series since 09. It's like, yeah, but we got 27, uh, bro. Uh, 27 rings. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, 100%. His pride in New York was so ridiculous. But I also got such a kick out of Madsen's line saying that from up here it looks like Legoland. <laughs> But Kendall should have countered and said, hey, Seoul and Singapore, they don't have bodegas on every street, right? New York City, the only place <laughs> for bodegas. Chopped cheese or anything there. <laughs> no siree. He is such a fully realized character to the point of, I believe that he exists in the real world. <laughs> the characters aren't similar, but I feel the same way about Sylvester Stallone playing Rocky, where Sylvester Stallone is the fake person and Rocky's the real character. Right, yeah. Kendall is the real character. Jeremy Strong is fake. But then you see the moment, I, I got such a kick out of that too, dude, when he has Frank uh, in the room with all the coats, and he's like, let's run this all the way back. And Frank's like, <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> like, to the beginning, bro, season yeah. one, Kendall and Frank against the world. Well, I'm trying to flip it to buy Gojo now. Again, it's just like, just constantly biting off more than you could chew. What does he call it? Reverse Viking? Yeah. We pillage their village? So fucking funny, dude. But Frank, once again, can't resist, right? The whole season, he's been trying to get out. Uh, it's Carl talking about the golden parachute, but with Frank, it's similar. But you see the glitter in his eyes. No, we could actually do this. Yeah. And especially with that piece of information that they get from Ebba. It was so pathetic, the attempt that Kendall and Roman made to uh, <laughs> console her. Yeah. <laughs> on a human level. <laughs> you know, we just wanted to make sure, check in, make sure you're okay. Like, on a human level. So ridiculous. Right, but she, like, that was enough. Like, she was ready to spill to anybody at that point. She right. just had enough. And I guess just that reflection, too, with Roman's problems with he's having with Jerry as well, where that all comes to a head here, and he can't, like, charm or use their relationship to kind of brush it away this time. She's fucking serious. She's tired of this shit, and this is what's going to happen, or I'm going to show the world you're a dick. Yeah, and the misogyny was front and center, and they do that so well with the writing where it's not them preaching at us, but it's just showing it. Ebba's being bullied by Matson and his team. Jerry has been bullied by Roman, and he thinks that he can smooth it over with his awkward charm, but Jerry's serious about getting out, and what Matson does to Shiv, where He's stringing her along and then pulls out the rug when this information is revealed and tells her, you need to build me a new India, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. And these characters who have worked so hard throughout their careers, like Eva and like Jerry, it's just an extra obstacle that you have to go through where, yeah, you're allowed to play with the big boys, but that is always going to be present, that you are women and that men will feel the freedom to casually bully you even in social settings, behind closed doors, or in front of everybody to watch. And it does come back to bite them. So a character like Roman Roy, you know, you reap what you sell. And Jerry tells him, I could have brought you to the top. That was such a valuable relationship for him, and it's gone. It's over. And he's he's been struggling these fat past few episodes. Yeah, and it's kind of funny, too, how you can kind of relate that to what Shiv does to Tom. The gender roles of this specific situation and how you talked about how they kind of, they show you how a lot of this plays out in a real world, where Shiv kind of uses that against Tom and how that affects him being in that position, as we see many people throughout the show have been, and kind of him feeling a little insecure about him himself and his position when... And basically everyone's going around talking about how he's going to get fired. And Shiv kind of just laughing it off and not really thinking about how that makes Tom feel at all. Right, yeah. And we talked about it on the last episode that their relationship is a, in a healthier place because it's unconditional. They're not looking for anything out of the other. But now Tom is watching Shiv dance around that room, laughing it up with all the people who are making fun of him. Matson essentially telling him that the ass kissing is not enough. It may have worked for Logan. It's not going to work for me. Dude, it really trickles down from the top, from Logan to her kids, to the way Shiv treats Tom and the way Tom treats Greg and how, how Gr Greg is starting to treat people lower than him now where they've all been in that position and they just, it's done to them and they, you know, it's kind of like when you have a parent who's abusive and how you become an abuser later on in your life because that's just all you know. Yeah, no, it is very simple. Hurt people, yeah. hurt people. And it's so hard to feel pity towards Tom because in the beginning of the episode when they're firing all the ATN employees, he's doing the crying phase. Right. He pushes that responsibility off on Greg, which I thought was a funny part of this episode that Greg is, his best talent is firing people. <laughs> that's his best skill. He um, should have taken... Talk about someone who should have just taken the money. Oh, God, yeah. That's one of the dumbest They can't things, resist yeah. it, man. Oh, I would have been 
chilling out in Bora Bora. But the quote that he says, it's not a layoff, it's a conscious uncoupling from an employment-based relationship. (laughs) The parallels to the real world are very obvious, where you have them (laughs) planning this soiree, this exquisite party with the best wine and the best food and the best caterers, and we also need to fire 100 people because it's a cost-cutting initiative. (laughs) Dude, it's not funny, but like I was watching the Kentucky Derby at a bar, and next to it the news was on, and they had all the protests in the subway, and I was just looking at like this this is both happening at the same time. These massive protests over this very significant event that affects real people, and then there's just people like a Kentucky Derby drunk throwing away money in their finest clothes. <laughs> I'm just like it was just kinda like seeing them both on the screen at the same time happening. I'm like, this is kind of this is fucking crazy. And it's kind of like the same like how we talked about the way he looks down in New York City, like while all this shit's going on and all the problems, this is what they're focused on here. <laughs> And I think that's just what makes the show so great. Like you said, it's so hard to feel bad for Tom in that moment when he is making the gestures while all these people are getting laid off and affecting their lives. But like certain moments in this episode, you generally feel bad for Tom. Right. And they do a great job of dehumanizing normal people. In that meeting, they can't even sit down with them face to face. They have them on a Zoom call, even though they're all probably present in the same building. I can't imagine Waystar lets employees work from home anymore. (laughs) They strike me as one of those companies that canceled that early 2021. Uh, The conversation between Roman and Connor talking about uh, which ambassadorship should he take, right? Like, oh, you can't do South Korea because they actually matter. We'll put you in one of these countries that, what did they call Oman? Poor man's Saudi Saudi Arabia. Con, they're not going to put you anywhere with nukes. Well, that's insulting. I don't think I want to go anywhere that doesn't have nukes. All right. So it's just the way that they talk. It's like Pokemon cards or trading cards, right? Yeah, Yeah, I'll cancel my campaign and you give me a a nice, cozy position. And even that conversation was so funny between Roman and Connor when he says he wants you to drop out for the good of the country and Connor can't help but laugh. (laughs) That was such a genuine laugh from Connor. So, no? No. And I don't think Alan Ruck gets uh, enough credit for his performance as Connor. Where even the moment when Roman bugs out on him, what he says about Willa, I I thought Connor was about to punch him. Great framing from the director, because you're not sure. He does get up sort of like a hulking figure. A great clapback, too, that the only person in this room that doesn't think I'm a joke is Willa, so I'm going to listen to her. (laughs) Through all the bullshit, it seems like they're going to come out the cleanest. And it looks like they have the healthiest relationship, which is so funny looking back on season one. When you were always so... The secondhand embarrassment from Connor was unavoidable. But now it it does feel like, yeah, Will is the only one who truly has his back. Well, because they're kind of... They're transparent with each other. I mean, Willow put it all on the table, like something that I think Tom might have been scared to admit, but obviously everyone knew. But, you know, Willow's like, yeah, it does matter. <laughs> like, this is part of the thing. But still, like, even with all that being said, like, I still want to be with you. And she's shown hesitation and she's made herself very clear about some of her, you know, her hesitations with Connor and he's made it clear too. So like, yeah, like in the healthiest relationship standpoint, like they, they probably have the healthiest dynamic. <laughs> Well, that's a great point about transparency because they often say honesty can make or break a relationship. With Willa and Connor, it has made their relationship. And then at the end of this episode, honesty has broken, Mm -hmm. possibly, the relationship between Shiv and Tom. Because they trade insults, things that you could never take back. And especially what Tom says about Shiv. He said she's so transparent, he doesn't even need a book. (laughs) Damn, the writing in this show is fucking crisp. And the fact that it's a six-minute-plus-long scene unabridged from a dramatic standpoint it's as epic as you can make a scene it's shades of ingmar bergman's scenes from a marriage where the writing is incredible the acting is incredible where you're so invested in the scene itself but you want it to end because of how tense it actually is and then the final dagger is when he says that you know you shouldn't uh, you wouldn't have my kid but i don't even think that you should be a mother and shiv you could tell just based on the response that's not a nice thing to say is it tom because normally they can brush off the insults but that one really hurt where she has to acknowledge oh that was meant to really hurt me huh (laughs) yeah i think if you want to like look at who won the argument um like i think tom like really was the one who was making the better points and like got to shiv because for a while it was kind of the other way around here but you know even shiv's defenses and the way she frames like some of her decisions or why she's doing this it's just seen very very much on the defensive in this moment like he finally is able to let it all out because he's been so even keel at times and yeah, he's been a punch easy to forgive and not letting what he truly feels out this was the time for it to happen 
Right, and she does make a couple of good points, like uh, something that I totally forgot. He did propose to her in the hospital after Logan had a stroke, so he does put her in a tough spot there. So yeah. I think the emotional manipulation from Tom's side was a bit more subtle and infrequent than Shiv's. Shiv definitely has, you know, they've hurt each other, and <laughs> you see it in the beginning of the episode when he gifts her a scorpion. You kill me, but I love you. So you have the scorpion, and then what does she call him? She calls him a couple of animals, but I think she settles on snake. Yeah, Yeah, I think she even called him a rat in the street, (laughs) which, you know, technically he was. She calls him out about the betrayal, uh, going to Logan, and blames him for the separation between Shiv and Logan over the last six months. But he tells her, listen, I gave you approval. I gave you love. That was never enough for you. You are broken. But he decided to hitch his wagon with Shiv. He knew what he was getting into. So that's why... These two crazy kids, man. I saw an article after the last episode. Tom and Shiv are definitely not getting that divorce. And in the beginning of the episode, they're talking about how they're going to handle the public perception of them getting back together. We've said this before about character relationships in this show, that there's no coming back. I don't know. I don't don't know if there's a way back for them and for Cherry and Roman, too. She is pregnant, so... And I also think that could be something that's never addressed in the last three episodes. Where maybe there'll be signs that she's not pregnant anymore. And that's the final straw between making that decision, because you, you would think the next step in their newfound relationship would be to tell Tom, hey, I'm pregnant. We, we're not sure whose baby it is, but I'm going to guess that it's Tom's. Look at this. I'm having your baby. But yeah. now after, after he said that, you know, you're so close to what you've always wanted. And, uh, and it all blows up. It's a re- seems like a reoccurring theme. Man, the way Kendall has been moving, though. So great speech, too, when Matson interrupts the moment of silence and then he says, let the games begin. He did a better job in this episode of going at Matson and getting some of those last words and witty responses, even though their conversation about New York was very ridiculous. But he drops that bomb in front of everybody that Matson has been inflating some of these numbers. And the real world parallels, he's not a real coder. We've built up this image for the public. Right. So <laughs> he is as full of shit as everybody in this room. He's just really good at playing the game. So that's why he's the perfect stand-in for Logan, because he's younger, he's taller, he's Alexander Skarsgård, and he fits right in. At first he says, oh, I didn't know if I was going to handle this, but all these people care about is money and gossip. I fit right in, even if I'm the Swedish tech bro who dresses in ridiculous tracksuits and he was wearing Kyrie's, he 100% would be, I stand with Kyrie during the 2021 season. So it was cool to see some of his allure get washed away in this episode. Right, because he was such a presence, and he really felt like he was just bullying Kendall and Roman throughout this whole process here. But yeah, I mean, Kendall had a couple wins, a couple of losses in this episode. I feel like, obviously, what he tried to get out of his bringing Nate to the party didn't really succeed in that front. He kind of flubbed that. Um, but yeah, with Madsen, I think he held his own and definitely was able to kind of turn the tables a little bit, where he's going to be on the offensive now. And Kendall's always fun when he's on the offensive, when he gets cocky. Yeah, dude, the line that he has about... One head, one crown. Dude, his lines are so fucking funny. He just makes shit up sometimes. <laughs> well, it was great when Shiv... <laughs> like, I feel like he just throws out words. They just don't make sense. It's like, yeah, let's go, uh, you know, we should go like 80s Kubrick on him, huh? Full metal jacket. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the right move. It's like, what, what the fuck are you talking about? Well, the line Shiv has when she calls him Waystar Royco Jesus, it's such a funny comparison that we didn't pick up on, but he, he's literally promising these people eternal life, <laughs> right? And the, at the end of that last episode, when he's in the water, he's quite literally floating, so he probably feels invincible. And now that he's going to have Frank back on his side and <laughs> hasn't really helped him in the past, Frank's advice and Frank's support, but he's going to feel even more confident that they can flip this on Matson and buy Gojo. It's a perfect way to set up these last three episodes, literally bringing it back to the beginning. It's coming full circle. So I'm so excited to see how these last three episodes uh, finish off this incredible run of television. But you have to imagine... Kendall moving like this, so confident, so full of uh, arrogance and pride about what he could possibly accomplish, is not going to go down well. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to go down the way he thinks it's going to go down. Well, I'm very excited for next episode, the election. We kind of got like a, you know, they called it a tailgate, but like a pregame to what that's going to be like of all the, you know, influence and the type of people they had this party for, talking about Mankin and you know, his polling numbers aren't so great and how they're going to kind of help combat that and their relationship between the campaign and ATN. So that's all very fascinating. It's a fun backdrop for what is their family drama. 
Yeah, dude, and I just wanted to mention Connor, Roy, and Maxim Pierce, one of the most underrated odd couples in this show. They don't get much screen no. time together, but that's one of my favorite tropes is the affable dopes who are on opposite ends of the ideological spectrum, <laughs> but they're cool with each other. Yeah. So Maxim offering him this advice, why don't you take South Korea? And Connor's first instinct is, I prefer North Korea. Open it up like Nixon did China. <laughs> He's another one. Even though it's it's a it's far more silly, his aspirations are just as ambitious and just as ridiculous, right? <laughs> Open up North Korea to the world and go down in the history books. But that pairing together are, are so fun. Their personalities, to me, mesh so well. And as I said, Alan Ruck, a very underrated performer in this cast. I have to check. See what my woman thinks about Oman. <laughs> nice. The performances of... Sarah Snook and Matthew McFadden continue to be the highlight. It's that real, raw, genuine emotion that they're able to bring out of these scenes, especially Sarah Snook, uh, where I'm really on board with the whole, you know, this is the scene that won her an Emmy. There are multiple scenes throughout yeah. this season that could be her Emmy tape. No, from an acting standpoint, obviously, it's hard not to pick that scene because of what it entails and the emotion pouring out. And, you know, obviously a lot of these performances, what make them so great is the subtleties to them. But seeing them two on that balcony really let it out and have at it was just one of the more gripping, dramatic television scenes I've seen in a while where like you, d you really didn't know where it was going to go, who, what was going to be said. And you're just on the edge of their seat, hanging on every word and just seeing them kind of just let it all out there was very entertaining. Right. Yeah. And it was a long time coming between the characters. I think from the outside looking in and the insults that they trade almost come off as petty. And I think that's what helps the realness in those moments because it feels so awkward. Like when you're watching Kendall and Madsen trade blows, it's fun. It's awkward for the characters in that situation, for the characters in the room, but those moments between Shiv and Tom, they get awkward for the audience. Because yeah. I think there is a sense of wanting to see them together or rooting for them because they do have great chemistry, and the performances have been so memorable. Like we mentioned, the love is no longer unconditional. So what they experience in this episode, and it's brilliant what they're able to do in 60 seconds, as I said, start them at this high point and end it on the lowest of lows. It's an emotional wrecking ball that ends this, this episode. You know, that, con <laughs> that confrontation between them could have some very interesting consequences for what they're both trying to accomplish. And we also got talk about the funeral. I thought it was such a funny throwaway joke of Connor saying that a good funeral is a tight 90. Yeah. So we don't want to go too far. Nothing worse than a funeral that outstays its welcome. <laughs> that episode three was emotionally devastating for these characters. And even the aftermath, even though they get back into the, the maneuvering and the politicking, it's still weighing on them. But now Logan's funeral has become an afterthought where Kendall's sitting down and he's scrolling on his phone. They've all got their different plans and ideas that they want to put into action. So it's only been a couple of days and now it's just like not as important. Yeah. And I think what's more most impressive too what four episodes removed uh four episodes now without logan you know that's as great as episode three was i feel like a lot of fans might have been like well you know logan was such a great part of the show like how, what's succession gonna look like without this presence and i think they did a good job of keeping that presence there while albeit logan not being around but also the way these characters and act performances have able been able to fill that void flawlessly and you know, and not lose a step at all has been very impressive. Right, yeah, and a lot of credit does have to go to Alexander Skarsgård, especially a guy of that status being willing to take on a role like this where he's, you could argue for the most part, he is a minor character, maybe elevated now to a supporting mm -hmm. slash antagonist type of character. But he's done a great job of filling that void. And he's so dynamic as a performer where... Even though his presence, as I said, he's a tall, good-looking man, he is just so petty and as immature as all these characters. He, <laughs> he's such a wannabe tough guy, and he exudes that uh, facade so well through his performance. So he's been a, a, he was a great addition last season, and he's really stepped up his game here. It's just the writing, man. There's so many things that you can pick from the script that... You know, the, the way that it further develops these characters, the way they relate things to the real world, the metaphors and uh, the characterization. It's been essentially flawless this final season. That's what's been so yeah. impressive. Well, even going back to like what I said before, it's like, why do you care so much? You're going to be billionaires regardless. Even from his perspective now, when you look at uh, Madsen, like 
it almost feels like it's like why do you why go through all this trouble like you're pretty well off already and it's not like waystar is the end all be all when it comes to your success and obviously expanding and seeing it the way he does he obviously finds it beneficial but at a certain point it almost feels like his main goal is just to beat kendall and like get one over on them you know they almost lose sight of like what the deal and what it is actually about and it becomes just a personal pissing match right yeah as much as they say it's not personal it's business but it becomes very personal for these characters they're just all fucking tumors they just keep growing. They just want more out of life. The world is, is truly not enough for any of them. So it's going to be fun to see, you know, how this show ends off. You know, who, is somebody going to end up on top? I think that would be <laughs> bold of them as well. The showrunner has said that bad people get away with the bad things they've done and don't face those consequences. So <laughs> it's also funny with Matson. The one thing, you know, it's not harassing one of your employees and sending her all these unwanted messages and literally sending her leaders of your blood. But it's making up subscriber numbers in India that's going to be the thing that cans him. <laughs> it's not the personal abuse, but right. it's it's possibly trying to pull a fast one on Wall Street and investors. It always comes down to the money. So you can do whatever you want in your personal life. You can be as bad as you want, but don't lie to us about our money. That's how we'll get you. So maybe that's the nail in the coffin. What do you think wins the election? Oh, I'm such a goddamn bleeding heart lib because I'm like, Jimenez better win that shit. Make him a- <laughs> it was like, what does Kendall say? It's like, oh, like uh, something along the lines of just like a bunch of Nazis and libtards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, you take care of the Nazis. I'll, I'll handle the libtards. I'll hit the libtards. You go help the Nazis. The Nazis, you got it. And it was a funny line Roman had to shiv about, um, he's like, well, I'm not too worried because if my side wins, they're just going to shoot your side. Yeah. <laughs> and Shiv was like, oh, that, that's nice to know. And I like how they kept true to Gil Evis being the surrogate Bernie Sanders, him not winning the primary. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. They all dropped out when they saw that <laughs> Gil was leading the polls. <laughs> had to get that motherfucker out of there. Did we ever get any confirmation? Like, does Connor have a running mate? No, I think it'd be funny if it was Maxim, right? Yeah. They always talk about this. Why don't a conservative and a liberal just run together, right? He's his Joe Lieberman. Hey, he's getting 4 or 5% in Alaska. <laughs> I'm smelling an upset here. That talk back and forth about the ambassador positions was so goddamn disrespectful. God, those people fucking suck. <laughs> They are just irredeemable pieces of garbage. Dude, we see it. It's it's so far. We see it every, like, election cycle, too, which just, like, go toe-to-toe debating, and then it's like, well, I'll drop out, though, if you get me the better, the right position. Right, yeah. That's all that matters is personal status. Yeah. Pearl of Arabia. Huh? All right, guys, that does it for our review of Succession Season 4, Episode 7. We will be back next week for Episode 8, America Decides. That's going to be a fun one. You think they're going to get Kornacki? A little cameo? Maybe if John King wasn't available. (laughs) Probably too high of a price to get the John King cameo. They'll settle for the poor man's John King. That's just disrespectful. (laughs) Steve Korwacki. Wow, that was probably our best review yet. Hey guys, Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video. Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind-the-scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make nerd soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy-ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits.